Hi, everybody. Dr. Wohler here uh, for Integrative Medicine Academy. This is a Great Plains Laboratory sponsored webinar. I want to uh, wish you all to uh, hope you're having a good day. And this is an interesting talk, um, chronic candidiasis. So the angle I'm going to take with this is talking about some clinical considerations. So if you're a healthcare practitioner, this will make sense to you just from patients that you might be seeing in your practice. If you are a parent of a child or loved one with autism, for example, or somebody else who might be struggling with chronic candida, uh, this is going to be you know, relevant for you as well. <clears throat> so all of my talks, you know, I like to get into the meat of things uh, in some regards when it comes to you know, pathogenicity and some biochemistry. We won't go too heavy in the biochem today. Um, but I want, I, I want to get people thinking about the complexity of candida because, you know, clearly it's not an easy issue to resolve for many patients. Now, I've been an integrative and functional medicine physician for probably going on, what, 20, 23, 24 years now. I've done a lot of clinical education for Great Plains Laboratory over the years. I do monthly webinars. I also teach the, their organic acid test uh, seminar on the use of the oat test in clinical practice. And I've spoken throughout the United States as well as international, uh, written a number of books. I'm a practicing clinician as myself. And I work a lot with individuals with autism, but I work with other patients too. Uh, GI problems, neurological disorders. I'm the co-founder of Integrated Medicine Academy, which is an online training academy for healthcare practitioners of different courses in integrative and functional medicine. And then we also have a website called Functional Medicine Clinical Rounds, which is, uh, it's actually a one-on-one -on -one mentorship type of website for healthcare practitioners as well, who are looking for a, a additional assistance in helping with, you know, interpret lab tests and case analysis, et cetera. So we're gonna do some general information about candida, get into some examples of chronic candidiasis and just mechanisms of pathogenicity, pros and cons of various lab tests when it comes to detection and invasiveness and what it means, some treatment considerations. And then at the end, we'll wrap up with some resources for additional information. So when we're talking about candida, we're talking about yeast, right? These are organisms that fall in a category of yeast. All of these organisms from mushrooms, mold, yeast, fall in this biological category or grouping called fungi. So candida is a yeast, which is a fungi. Aspergillus is a mold, which is a fungi, but candida is not a mold and aspergillus is not a yeast. But again, they all fall in this grouping called fungus. Now, one of the things about candida is that candidiasis, which is an infection, can be linked to really any form of candida species. And some are very pathogenic and others less so, um, candida albicans being the most common. And so these infections can occur in various places on or inside our body. So our skin, for example, as well as in our mouth, our esophagus, and certainly within the intestinal tract as well. So for example, oral thrush, which is that white patches that develop on the tongue, sometimes seen in elderly, commonly seen many times in infants, you know, is just an overgrowth of opportunistic candida. And then of course, people who are immune compromised um, have increased risk for this. Okay, and in some cases, you know, oral candidiasis can actually, let me get a pen here, go down into the esophagus and really make it painful to swallow. So they actually have like a, an oral nystatin that you can do a, what's called a swish and swallow on to help with that. Now, candida, as a, a general rule, is actually considered a commensal organism within and on our body. Okay, and figure, the figures are about 80% of the human population exists without candida, without it causing any harm. And now, typically, what they're getting at is that 
you know, not harm, meaning causing some type of immune compromised disease or causing some kind of serious infection. There are people who have candida issues that could be affected in other ways. So we know in autism, for example, candida can contribute to behavioral problems. Others, it might lead to fatigue or headaches. Those aren't life-threatening situations, but they're problematic and disruptive nonetheless. But here's the take-home message. If candida were easy to deal with, this lecture would be five minutes long. Okay, we wouldn't need to go through all of this. So the, the, from the fact that we're actually gonna be talking about this pretty in depth, and we could take any one of these topics and expand it into an entire day of, of lectures, candida is a complex issue. It doesn't just become a problem all on its own. These are organisms that live in our body and on our body. They've been around a lot longer than we have. They are highly complex and they're highly sophisticated. And so I understand people's frustrations when it, when it comes to treating their candida issues or the child's candida issues. But again, these things are sophisticated. They don't always easily go away. And we always have to realize that if we're not making any headway in dealing with a chronic yeast problem, there's something else going on or multiple things going on. That could be mold toxins, that could be heavy metals, that could be chemical exposures, it could be other food sensitivities, other things causing damage in the gut, or other things causing weakness within the immune system. So again, these things have been around for a long, long time, and, and so have humans, but you know, it these problems seem to have, you know, really been on the rise, you know, over the past, you know, hundred some odd years, maybe even less as far as what's recognized within medicine. But there's always been people who've been highly susceptible to more systemic issues related to candida, uh, in some cases in a, in a very severe form. Let's go through a few examples of just pathogenicity. Candida will exist as what's called a unicellular form but it has a high propensity to become invasive. And when it becomes invasive, it starts to grow these hypha, these tentacles, these roots that can invade into the lining of the digestive system. If you seed candida intact into the bloodstream, it has the ability to thrive in the bloodstream causing a bloodstream infection, something called candidemia. That's fortunately not a real common scenario. Candida produces a variety of different proteins, adhesin protein and advasin protein that allow it to adhere to epithelial cells in the digestive system. The invasive protein allows it to become invasive. A couple of different processes here, active penetration and something called induced endocytosis. And so we can have a candida that is adhering to an epithelial cell, but if we have good diversity and health within the digestive system, it keeps things in check. Okay, that's making the assumption that we have good bacteria, that we, that we don't have inflammation or immune dysfunction or toxins. Because if we have that, then the immune system of the gut becomes compromised and it allows for candida to start to thrive and become problematic. Here we have a candida cell, what's called endocytose, where it incorporates itself into an epithelial cell or it grows its hypha, its tentacles, and starts to peer either through the tight junction of the cell or grow right through an epithelial cell and engage the immune system that's sitting down below it. If you think about things clinically, if you're a practitioner, one of the things of why this could be problematic is what ends up happening is certain cytokines get produced, including interleukin-6. And interleukin-6 actually can interact with the pituitary and the adrenal cortex to produce cortisol. And it likely does that in a way to help regulate the immune system and regulate the immune uh, inflammation. But now we have immune chemicals getting produced in relationship to invasive candida interacting with the pituitary and the adrenal axis. And we can expand this out. And if any of you have 
heard some of my lectures before, or perhaps maybe you've taken a course through my Integrative Medicine Academy, we talk a lot about the chronic stress response and that various stressors, whether it's diet, whether it's environmental, whether it's physical injury, mental, emotional stressors, chronic infections, chemicals, et cetera, can all trigger activity in the hypothalamus, which then talks to the pituitary to output cortisol from the adrenal cortex. And too much cortisol over time will actually blunt the hypothalamus's ability to respond appropriately to adrenal activity. And then over time, that leads to problems in blood sugar metabolism, salt water retention, cardiovascular influences, as well as creating problems within the immune system. And so chronic infections and yeast overgrowth and fatigue and autoimmune, for example, all can be linked back to this chronic stress response. But if you just remember what I just said about invasive candida, it too could be a contributing factor into triggering activity within the pituitary adrenal axis through the receptors that exist in both areas. Now, what's well recognized in functional and integrated medicine, not so well recognized in conventional medicine is gastrointestinal candidiasis. In conventional medicine, they pretty much just assume that it's normal, right? Because candida can normally exist in the gut and does. But what we recognize and have seen over the years is that susceptible individuals are um, susceptible to some of the toxins that get produced by candida that is living in the digestive system. Arabinos, for example, we'll talk about here shortly. I see it a big problem in autism. Okay, that's not to say that every autistic individual has the same reaction to candida. Sorry, my slides want to be jumping forward here. Okay, but many of them, it contributes to digestive system problems, but that's not unique to autism. That occurs in many patients when they have an overgrowth of yeast. But it often leads to behavioral issues, cognitive issues in, again, certain individuals. Arabinose, for example, is a specific type of organic acid that gets produced in the presence of invasive candidiasis that's occurring within the digestive system. It's actually what's called a sugar aldehyde. I'll talk about that here shortly. And Dr. Shaw from Great Plains many years ago has written a lot about this, spoken a lot about this over the years, and this is where I learned this information. There was an article in the mid-90s where he was looking at arabinose in twins with autism um, and watched what happened when they were put on antifungal medication. And that also led into to additional research looking at other, what were called organic acids, often highly represented in that type of patient group. So if any of you have done an organic acids test from Great Plains, on page one, there are a number of markers linked to yeast and fungus. Okay, arabinose is very common. Okay, in that particular case at 103 is quite high. Now the reference ranges for organic acids on this test change based on age or weight and sex. So greater than 13 years of age, less than 13 years of age, the reference ranges can look different. But it, when, when the other clinical thing you always have to think about, right, is that we're not treating a test, we're treating individuals. And so we always have to correlate that information to the clinical presentation of the person. Again, we're not just throwing medications and botanical remedies at a number on a test. Um, we wanna try and determine the severity of the individual and that many times can help to help us determine what might be most effective for them. Now, some labs will use arabitol, also called arapinitol, which is produced by yeast. What ends up happening typically is that arabinitol is converted into arabinose. One is an alcohol, another is an aldehyde. An aldehyde is a chemical that contains a carbon, two oxygens, and a, and a hydrogen, a double bonded oxygen and a hydrogen. Now, all of these chemicals can naturally exist in our body, but aldehydes by their nature 
are just a little bit more challenging biochemically for our body to deal with. If we look at some of the information that comes out of the world of um, ethanol toxicity, so this is looking at information re regarding alcohol toxicity and longstanding use of alcohol. We know that alcohol itself can have a damaging effect to the lining of the gut. It can not only create reactive oxygen species that generate free radical damage, okay, that just damage the absorptive surface in the, in the digestive tract. It can lead to tight junction damage that leads ultimately to leaky gut. So now we start getting things moving through the lining of the gut that normally wouldn't, wouldn't be there. And that can be a triggering event for inflammation and autoimmune reactivity. So when, when we think about chronic candidiasis, we, we have to consider the fact that it can lead to leaky gut. Now, aldehydes, another aspect is these aldehyde chemicals. Okay, so arabinose is an aldehyde. And they can damage a lot of things in the body. They can damage the DNA. They can damage proteins. They can damage mitochondria. They can cause what's called lipid peroxidation. That basically damages cell membranes in the body. And we also can get glutathione depletion. So there's many things that can occur from just a chronic overgrowth of candida in the digestive system. It doesn't always have to be invasive or it doesn't have to be seeding the bloodstream intact as a intact cell causing a blood infection. We can still get problems from it. Now, Dr. Shaw has also looked at arabinose in the autism population, as I mentioned before, and what he has found and what we have all learned from this over the years is that many autistic individuals tend to have higher amounts of arabinose than neurotypical kids of the same or similar age. It's, it's, it's not that the neurotypical kids don't have some of it. It's just that the autistic kids in general tend to have a lot more of it. They also tend to be very sensitive to the presence of arabinose and, and some of these other yeast compounds that get produced. Yeast cells love glucose, right? So they're gonna take glucose and convert it into ethanol. That's the end product. And people can have adverse behavior secondary to this or just feel the effects of it, okay? Whether, whether it's causing achiness in the body, whether it's causing headaches, whether it's compromising attention or focusing. And as I just mentioned, just the alcohol itself could be damaging to the lining of the gut. What we commonly see in autism is behavioral issues associated with high levels of candida. Anxiety, emotional instability, sensory seeking behavior. I've seen all kinds of weird things happen. Heightened seeking of masturbation, seeking pressure. Now, I can't state that in every autistic individual that if these things are occurring, that it's 100% always a yeast problem. But percentage wise, it's usually um, very high, okay? That these things are associated um, with yeast or at least in part. Silliness, goofiness, giddiness, inappropriate laughter, acting drunk, okay? Very characteristic of a candida overgrowth in the body. Um, there are adults who are very sensitive to these compounds too that can have similar types of reactions. Years ago, when I was in Southern California, there was a massive forest fire that started in the East County of San Diego and started burning towards the Pacific Ocean. And there was a, a child who was my practice at that time who was you know, fairly severe as far as on the autism spectrum. And he always struggled with candida issues. And, but at this particular time, he was pretty well regulated on just supplements and diet. So the fire comes raging through and it's throwing smoke towards the Pacific Ocean. And this family actually lived down from and basically became embedded in smoke. Well, in this smoke is a lot of allergens and pollutants. And I used to see it when I lived in Southern California that 
a lot of kids with autism, whenever they had a lot of allergies or allergy season, if they had underlying candida problems, it would just become exacerbated and their behaviors would change. In this particular case, the child had such a severe reaction to the smoke and they also were getting goofy, giddy, silly, irritable, but they started fecal smearing in the house. And this happened really fast. So I felt like I didn't have time to run any tests. I just went ahead and put them on some medication. I actually treated them with Diflucan. And my assumption was correct because within about 72 hours, the fecal smearing behavior disappeared and then the smoke moved on. So it was, a, it was a lesson to me at that time of how quickly behavior in susceptible individuals can change in the presence of in, uh, high levels of developing candida, even just within the digestive system. Another clinical thing to consider with regards to candida is the ability to produce oxalates. It turns out that an enzyme called isocitrate lyase exists within these organisms. And what they do is they capture certain um, components of the Krebs cycle. In this particular case, taking isocitrate and converting it to glyoxalate. Glyoxalate then goes off to produce oxalate or oxalic acid. We know that oxalates in the body can interact with minerals, particularly calcium, leading to calcium oxalate crystals or calcium oxalate salt. And this can deposit in the kidneys over time, or it can deposit in body tissue, leading to pain and discomfort. And many individuals have oxalate problems. It can be in part secondary to yeast and fungal overgrowth in the digestive system. Okay, we know that the number one cause of oxalate is diet. Okay, yeast and fungus would certainly be contributing to that as well. There are genetic factors that lead to it, but it's always important to suspect a yeast and fungal problem secondary to high oxalic acid. This is something that's picked up, by the way, on the organic acids test from Great Plains Lab. So there are many conditions in which candida can be a problem. Okay, we, I've just touched on a few of these. Vaginal yeast infections, okay? Certainly many women get this and they take some medication, it goes away and they're fine. But others, it can trigger, unfortunately, a condition called vulvodynia in a specific form of it called cyclical vulval vaginitis. And I learned about this years ago. I had a young woman that came to see me she was 22, 23 years old at the time, um, very active, uh, you know, riding bikes and everything else. And she developed vulval vaginitis secondary to a vaginal yeast infection. And the only time she felt well was when she took Diflucan. And it would work for a couple months. And then all of a sudden, the pain would come back and really cause a lot of distress. Well, there was an article that came out in 1999 that was discussing this. And one of the things that these authors discussed is that women who have this condition, even if the yeast cultures are negative, they advocated for putting them on anti-candida medication as well as a low oxalate diet. Because what's happening is, is that in many individuals who have this is that the oxalates are irritating the, um, the vaginal tissue leading to rawness, irritation, pain. And in some cases, it can really create a lot of issues from just daily activities, um, sexual intercourse problems, et cetera. And once I found out about it, I let this individual know and actually a low oxalate diet really helped. Well, oxalate issues are a big problem in some individuals with autism. Okay. Um, and again, it can have a link back to candida overgrowth problems. Usually in autism, when you see problems with oxalates, kids tend to be very irritable, very agitated. Uh, sometimes they'll get pain with urination or behavioral issues when they have to urinate. So everybody's a little bit different in how they react, but the oxalate scenario is quite common in certain patient populations. 
So bladder irritability, urethral pain, vulvar pain has a link to oxalic acid, which can have a link to high levels of candida. Pain on urination, but no confirmation of infection, suspect oxalates. Eye poking in children, usually this is in severe calcium deficient individuals where they're really gouging and poking at their eyes. But then in many individuals where it's just fibromyalgia, body aches and pain, um, trigger point tenderness, tendon pain, you know, these types of issues. So again, the organic acid is very important to do to help analyze for this. One of the other chemicals that gets produced by candida in relationship to glucose metabolism is acetaldehyde. aldehyde. And what's interesting about acetaldehyde, aldehyde, it too is an aldehyde, right? I talked about that earlier. Well, it turns out that if you think about this clinically, aldehyde or acetaldehyde is a known inhibitor of methionine synthase. So this brings in the discussion of the methylation cycle. Candida in some of the compounds it produces can interfere with methylation. Methionine is very important because it actually converts homocysteine to methionine. This is where our methyl B12 lives, for example. And I've seen over the years where individuals, some of them autistic, where you would suspect that they would react positively to methylcobalamin supplementation, sometimes don't. And they may not respond to it until their candida issue is either treated completely or at least reduced, where perhaps what's happening is we're reducing some of the accumulation of these toxic compounds that these organisms produce and it releases pressure on the methionine synthase, okay? So I've seen that come up a number of times. And so one of the things to consider is if you're not getting the positive response that you would suspect or expect from methylation supplements, it may be because you know, there's just ongoing interference from chronic candida. Let's look at a few things with regards to laboratory testing. Now, Many reference labs in the United States will have blood tests looking at antibodies, IgA, IgG, IgM, for example. IgA is most commonly associated with mucosal immunity within the digestive system. There's not a lot of it circulating in the blood. IgM is acute. It's, it's actually an acute responding antibody. So if you have elevated IgM, it's showing you that you have kind of a, an acute uh, active infection. IgG is more of a long-term exposure. So you could actually have IgG elevated from a previous exposure, but doesn't necessarily mean that it's an active problem. Immunizations, for example, trigger IgG antibodies. <clears throat> now, Great Plains actually has a IgG test to candida. This is actually an older slide here to their uh, IgG food allergy test. It's now called the IgG MAP test. But there is a component of that test that evaluates for IgG reactivity to candida. And the general feeling is if we start getting levels that you know, are above you know, what's considered the 97th you know, or 95th percentile, whatever, pretty, you know, pretty high up there, that we're probably looking at some kind of chronic ongoing candida issue. Now, this still could be just isolated of the digestive system, okay? Um, but you know, it's generating IgG. One of the things that happens with IgG is it can actually trigger inflammation. And that inflammation can not only be happening in the digestive system, it can be um, affecting things systemically throughout the body. Stool testing, it's been around a long time, okay? The, the, and, it, and it's pretty good at detecting for these yeast organisms. They can look through things through a microscope. They can also do what's called culture medium testing where they actually grow these organisms, organisms out in a culture dish. Now remember, 
the many of these yeast are normal inhabitants of our digestive tract. So there, there's always going to be some existence. We're never going to be 100% yeast free. That's just not going to happen. And just because you find, let's say, for example, you find, you know, some yeast on a stool analysis, it doesn't tell you if it's triggering immune activity. It doesn't tell you if it's invasive within the gut, you know, causing high levels of organic acid. It's just showing up elevated that that's what somebody saw through the microscope. Now you could extrapolate that information to somebody who is having gut problems, bloating gas, for example, and, and, and pretty much assume that there might be some association with candida. If they can culture it, right, which they're doing here in what's called a yeast culture, basically a little Petri dish, grow it out in the lab, then they can identify what kind of remedies are effective against it, whether it's a medication like nystatin or different types of botanicals. So the highly sensitive category means these remedies would be effective against the organism. The problem with stool testing when it comes to yeast detection is sometimes it doesn't show up, right? Because these organisms are complex, they're sophisticated, they don't always grow out in a stool test. So you really can't entirely rely on a stool analysis to rule out the presence of chronic candidiasis. Some labs do what's called PCR, the polymerase chain reaction, which is a DNA analysis where basically they're amplifying the sample. Okay, so they're it's sort of like turning up the volume of detection. Some of the controversies over PCR is that it may sometimes be oversensitive to the existence of organisms. And that I'm not going to get into all the debate about that, but that's that's some of the information that's out there that you know may be true in certain circumstances. My preference is and has always been to utilize the or information off the organic acid test as my primary tool of assessment. assessment. It doesn't mean I don't do stool testing, I do, but the stool testing is complementary to the oat test. Blood testing is certainly appropriate in many circumstances, but it too is complementary to what I'm finding on the organic acids test. Now, organic acids are compounds that contain carbon and hydrogen, okay? And these are things that we all produce naturally in our body. So lactic acid, for example, is a natural organic acid that we produced. And you've all felt it, you know, if you exercise too much or, or um, you know, that uh, you, you have any kind of problem in, in glucose metabolism, for example, it can be elevated in the body. But then there are organic acids that get produced by organisms that live in our digestive system. Okay, they're in our body. They're not really, I mean, they're part of our body, but they're not of our body. And they produce their own organic acids. And so the Great Plains oat uh, that looks under the yeast and fungal markers has a number of them. We know that arabinose is linked to candida. Carboxycitric, 3-oxoglutaric are, are linked to other forms of yeast citromolic as well. There are a few markers on this test that are listed to other fungi, okay? Number two, which is five, excuse me, uh, five hydroxymethyl 2 furoric furan 2,5-D-carboxylic, furan carbonyl glycine, and tartaric. Okay, these are actually linked to aspergillus mold. So remember, Aspergillus is a mold, is a fungi. Candida is a yeast, which is also a fungi. So they're all basically fungal markers. And then this last one down here called tricarboxylic, which is linked to Fusaria mold. So there's actually four mold markers and then arabinose to candida, carboxycitric, three oxygoteric, and citromolic to just other forms of yeast. Well, these are organic acids too. Okay, and these get produced and then within the digestive system are absorbed into the body, secreted out, excreted through the urine, and then 
measured on this test as a reflection of what's happening within the gut. So this particular one is showing us that we've got aspergillus mold colonizing the digestive system. Let me say a few things about mycotoxins as it comes to mold exposure. The mycotoxins are toxins produced by certain molds, but they're separate from the mold. The mold organism can be gone or eliminated or, or you know, killed off, but the mycotoxin can still remain in the body. They're very, very small. They can hide out in our tissue. They can get into our cells. They can disrupt DNA function and protein uh, processing. They can damage the mitochondria. And they can create a lot of issues. And there's many different types of mycotoxins. Okay, ochratoxin, for example, is produced by aspergillus. Um, Reoridin E, for example, is produced by stachybotrys mold. They have an adverse effect on immune function. And so if we have mycotoxin exposure, there's a great chance that we could have over time immune system problems that affect our ability to regulate and control candida that's living within our digestive system, as well as other things, bacteria or viruses that we might come in contact with. Some of these mycotoxins will suppress secretory IgA, that a main immune chemical that, that thrives within our digestive system. They can deplete glutathione, they can target mitochondria, they can damage the kidneys, they can damage the brain nervous system in susceptible individuals. And what's, what's showing up is the existence of these mycotoxins can damage mucosal immune function, increasing the chances of other opportunistic infections, including clostridia, as well as candida. And this is why I mentioned in the beginning, right? If you're having problems controlling candida, whether it's for yourself, whether it's for your child, whether it's for your patient, despite your best efforts in diet, in supplements and medications, it just is still present. Well, you need to start looking deeper. You need to start looking at other things because again, you know, candida doesn't become a chronic problem really just on its own unless something has allowed or multiple things have allowed it to become an issue. Mycotoxins are at least part of that, should be part of that discussion. So for example, this particular mycotoxin here called mycophenolic, which is produced by penicillium mold, suppresses immune function and will increase the chances for clostridia bacteria and chronic candidiasis. Let's look at a few intervention options. Okay, I'll take you back to this slide. All of these things warrant some investigation at some point if the candida scenario is not improving. Whether that's looking at food sensitivity, whether that's doing additional testing on chemicals and mold toxins, metals, et cetera. And, and you know, admittingly, this can take a little time, okay, it, to unravel. It's like peeling the layers of an onion, you know, it, it takes a little while to make it happen. The keys to chronic candida intervention come down to multiple things. It's not just about the antifungal. People often ask me, well, what's the best antifungal to use for candida? And it's like, well, there's many of them. It's like saying, what's the best medication to use for depression? There's a reason there's many different options. And that is, is none of these things work 100% of the time for everybody. And so we have to have different options. What is clear in, from my experience is that when it comes to chronic candidiasis, candida intervention, it's the consistent and ongoing use of antifungals, whether it's medication or botanicals or a combination, but sometimes it, it may, in, in some individual, it might be a few months and others it may be much longer than that. Diet is always a key component to regaining health. 
there is no one best diet that at least I have seen. And there may be others out there that argue with me on this point. But, you know, that's just the one diet in all circumstances that is, you know, the thing to implement for chronic candida. Just improving the quality of diet is important. I've had individuals who've had chronic yeast issues, you know, who do fine having some fruit, you know, fruit periodically or some carbohydrates and they, you know, but they've improved the quality of their diet and, you know, they do well. I've had other situations where somebody, you know, has an apple or has, you know, a small glass of juice or whatever, and it causes them to flare up. So many times the dietary approach um, is a process of just discovering what's going to work right for that particular individual. But one thing is clear is, is trying to eat as organically as possible, getting rid of refined food, getting rid of certainly refined sugars, for example, um, and then <clears throat> you know incorporating just more whole food diet. And there's much more that could be discussed from the dietary standpoint in another lecture. Trying to improve diversity of the microbiome, right? We know that if we have a diverse microbiome, that can help significantly. In fact, one of the greatest ways to improve the diversity of the bacterial microbiome in our gut is eating a diversity of plant-based foods. I actually went to a lecture years ago for my state um, for my um, my state medical conference. And there was a nutritionist that gave a two hour lecture on diet and the microbiome. She basically said trying to eat between 12 to 15 plant based foods per day, they showed had the greatest impact on improving the diversity of the microbiome. And I, I know there's all these different scenarios out there about oxalates, etc. But that's just as a general rule. If we've got chronic infections, We've got to try and deal with those. If we've got mold, we've got to figure out how to work through that as well. And then certainly there are chemicals that can be, uh, we're exposed to as well. A lot of times we can decrease a lot of chemical exposure by drinking you know, filtered water as well as eating more organically. Now, as, a, as an intervention, nystatin tends to work pretty well. Okay, it's a it's a antifungal medication. You can get it in tablet oral suspension. They also have topical applications of nystatin. One of the things about oral nystatin is it has very poor absorption, which is a benefit because it stays in the digestive tract. It needs to be dosed multiple times throughout the day. Some protocols actually call for four times per day. That might be okay for a short term use, you know, um, like you've got oral thrush, for example, where you do like a nice statin swish and swallow for a week, but try to do four times a day for many months for chronic candidiasis in the gut is pretty difficult. So most of the time I'll just have people do it three times a day. It's got a good safety profile overall. How it works is it basically binds to a chemical called ergosterol. And so it punches holes in the cell membrane of these yeast. Oral amphotericin B does the same thing. Okay, so we're talking about oral forms. So basically it causes these electrolytes to leak out of the candida cell and it dies. Okay, it comes in multiple strengths. Typically the tablets are 500,000 units, oral suspension, 100,000 units per ml. There is no, at least that I've seen, there is no established amount based on age or weight for all different circumstances. Typically what I do for adults, depending on how sensitive they are to supplements or even medications is start them off at one tablet, which would be 500,000 units, three times a day. And then we work them up you know, to two tablets three times a day, for example. For kids, um, we use an oral suspension, 100,000 units per ml. In most cases, I'll start off with maybe, you know, half a teaspoon, which is about 200, which is 250,000 units three times a day. 
or a range between one to you know half a teaspoon to a teaspoon. Um, very rarely have I ever gone up to two teaspoons three times a day or higher. I have on occasion where it seems warranted to do, and that's based on positive response or lack of response, tolerance, et cetera. When I look at Nystatin, to me, this is something that people generally go on for for at least a few months. Okay, I'm not typically just doing it right off the bat for a couple of weeks. If I'm using the organic acids test as my assessment tool, I'm, I'm looking to repeat that test in about 90 days, but I'm also having people make sure they follow up because I wanna see what kind of positive response they get. I have started at lower dosages, okay? Whether that is a quarter teaspoon, for example, for very sensitive individuals. Any of these antifungals, even botanicals can cause die off and die off is where the organisms are dying off and basically, it's kind of like they're spilling their guts, okay? Their toxins are being released, and, and that can trigger, you know, reactions in the digestive tract or trigger, you know, reactions in the body in certain, in certain cases. Die-off doesn't always happen. Usually, if die-off happens, it typically comes on within about 48 hours or so after starting antifungals, even botanicals, same thing. Now there are many systemic antifungals like diflucan. And this has been used for years for candidiasis as well as other fungal infections. And these are more, these are systemic, which means they get absorbed from the digestive tract and, and are circulated throughout the bloodstream in the body, which means they have more of a potential issue in causing things like liver stress or anybody who has some kind of um, cardiac sensitivity issue, what's called uh, QT prolongation, for example, can occur with diflucan. I've never personally seen that happen with anybody. By and large, fluconazole, some of the other systemic antifungals are usually well tolerated, but because of its systemic effects, they're used for shorter periods of time, unless you can make sure you're doing blood testing for liver enzymes. We know that there are certain systemic antifungals like Lamisil, for example, that are used for, for toenail fungus. People are put on it for three months, but they're not put on it typically for three months without checking their liver enzymes. Most kids tend to not have liver enzyme issues with these systemic antifungals in my experience, but they should still be checked if they're gonna be on it for prolonged periods of time. Okay, usually you know, greater than a month, for example. How fluconazole works is it also affects that ergosterol chemical, but it does it where it basically inter interrupts this enzyme called 14-alpha-demethylase. And, and basically what that amounts to is it just, it just interferes with the ability of the yeast cell to maintain its cell membrane. Okay, so the use of these medications is a intervention consideration. These are just examples. Okay, typically between 250 to 750,000 units of Nystatin, you know, 30, 60, 90 days is not unreasonable. If we're not getting clinical effect, fluconazole could be utilized. But again, it's utilized in more short bursts. Okay, if you got it, you know, if you have a patient who's on multiple medications, they're older, you know, a lot of comorbidities, you're going to be more concerned about that person when it comes to potential liver impacts. So, you know, there's different scenarios based on the type of person you're prescribing these for. When it comes to botanicals, the nice thing about botanical remedies is. They, they have a long track record of use. I like the fact that they, they throw a wide net. And what I mean by that is that they have the ability to attack these yeast organisms, but also opportunistic bacteria as well. Now, I mean, there's a, a, a list longer than my arm on different types of botanicals that have been shown to be helpful for candida, 
And so again, people sometimes ask, well, what's the best botanical for candida? It's like, well, there's a lot of good ones, whether that's garlic, whether that's black walnut, whether that's lavender, raspberry, echinacea, oregano oil, tea tree oil, okay? I'm a big fan of using combination botanicals. Again, because of that wide net effect. And so they have multi-use purposes. If we just look at a few examples like echinacea, it's been around a long time, right? It has a long use, history of use in you know, folk medicine, uh, North American indigenous peoples have used it for years for things like sore throats, headaches, cough, pain. And a lot of research has shown that it has anti-pathogen effects against candida, other types of bacteria, as well as, you know, a regulatory effect on the immune system. Oregano oil is another type of botanical, again, with, you know, been, been used for years, for centuries, actually, with a very good safety profile. There's a couple interesting chemicals in oregano. These are to, two what are called polyphenols, um, carbacrol and thymol that seem to have primary antimicrobial effects against candida. Ah, let me go back. Let's see, it doesn't want to go back. Hold on a second, let me get my, uh, this thing's been a little temperamental. Okay, it won't go back to me. Oh, there we go, sorry about that. All right, so again, combination botanicals. I've used biocidin for years. I like it from a standpoint, not only is it highly effective, the capsules are small, so even kids can swallow capsules. They also have liquid versions too that actually are pleasant tasting. And they've actually really expanded their product line from the regular biocidin to what's called the liposomal form, even have some as a throat spray good to have around, particularly in cold and flu season. One of the interesting things about botanical remedies is their intrinsic ability to attack biofilms. So one of the unique things about candida or these yeast organisms is they form biofilm. And these, the biofilm acts as a defensive layer that these organisms incorporate themselves into. The biofilm allows for them to thrive in their own little colonies and, and communities. They can send chemical signals through the biofilm that allow them to communicate with each other. And as I mentioned before, it acts as a, as, as a defensive shield. And so there's all kinds of discussions about how to attack these biofilms. Well, one of the interesting things about botanicals, if you just start poking around, is many botanicals have their own anti-biofilm properties. Whether it's disrupting the formation of a biofilm or disrupting chemical signaling within biofilm, curcumin, cinnamon, I mean, you'll be hard pressed to, to probably find really any botanical that wouldn't have some kind of anti-biofilm property. So this was a case of a young child that had all kinds of issues behaviorally that I've just you know, mentioned you know, previous in this lecture. An organic acid test going back and this initial organic acid test showed us that we had high levels of arab um, aspergillus mold. Okay, so four markers indicating aspergillus, high levels of arabinose indicating invasive candida. We even had a carboxycitric on the oat test indicating just yeast overgrowth in the gut. So just a lot of fungal yeast toxins coming from the digestive system and behaviors correlate with it. So an antifungal treatment was implemented. Okay. And again, this wasn't done just for a couple weeks. This was extended out over many, many months. So in this particular case, they were using some biocidin, okay, three times a day, for example, as a liquid. And then we're using nystatin and then rotating it 
with diflucan. So basically going from nystatin four weeks, switching to diflucan for four weeks, back to nystatin, back to you know, systemic antifungal. So it was a, it was a long standing intervention. And it needed to be because in that particular case, it wasn't just a candida problem that was happening. We also had a lot of mold and there was actually mold in their environment. So it was a more complicated scenario than just, hey, we've got a little bit of candida going on here. But over time, okay, there was a complete resolution of all of these factors and a significant improvement in the clinical presentation of this child better comprehension, less behavior issues, et cetera. So again, when it comes to candida, it's uh, please understand that this is not a situation where these organisms just sort of decide one day to become a problem. Something happens or things develop over time. And if you're not getting resolution, okay, no matter what remedies you're using, Okay, and you feel like you can't change the diet anymore. You've got to start digging deeper. You've got to start looking at other factors that could be contributing to why this problem is persisting. So for biobotanical remedies, you can actually contact biobotanical directly. They've got a, a lot of nice options. Um, you can contact them directly at their, their website and they'll one of the representatives can answer some questions. I would encourage everybody who's listening to this to contact New Beginnings Nutritionals. Now, New Beginnings Nutritionals is, um, they're a separate company, but they are associated with Great Plains. But more than that, the people who work at New Beginnings are fantastic. They know they've got a, an extensive catalog of products. They actually carry many of the biobotanical products my computer's wanting to jump ahead of me here, okay? Um, and they can actually help answer specific questions for you about how things taste, how some of these remedies can be mixed in food or drink or water, for example. You know, if you've got um, a patient that has a lot of sensitivity issues, they can talk to you about that. If you're working with a, a child with special needs, they can provide some insight and you know, different ways of mixing up some of these products. So check them out, use them as a good resource. If you're a healthcare practitioner and you haven't attended one of the Great Plains um, events through the GPL Academy, I would encourage you to do so, okay? I actually teach the entire organic acid test seminar on the incorporation of the basic fundamental aspects of the organic acid test into clinical practice, but they also have other lectures too on mold toxicity, chemical toxicity. So make sure to check out the GPL Academy. If you're interested in taking part in some of our online courses through our Integrative Medicine Academy, we have many. We actually have a very intensive autism mastery course. The material in here is designed for healthcare practitioners, but anybody can take this course. We have a course on SIBO, two courses actually on the use of the organic acid test. In fact, we're starting today an advanced oat mastery course, which goes through every single marker on the organic acid test from Great Plains in, in great detail functional medicine course, as well as toxicity, hormones, et cetera. So for more information, go to integrativemedicineacademy.com. If you are a healthcare practitioner, we also have a website called Functional Medicine Clinical Rounds, where we provide practitioners access to us through one-on-one -on -one consulting. So you can actually schedule time with us through this website to go over lab tests, talk about cases, clinical troubleshooting. We also have a lot of educational material. So there are videos that get produced um, on a bi-weekly basis on a variety of topics. Some could be lab reviews, some could be talking about research, clinical pearls. Again, I mentioned you can schedule consults with us directly 
through the website as practitioners. We have an interactive forum where you can post daily questions. We also have monthly live clinical rounds where we'll do about a 20, 30 minute presentation on a case analysis or a lab test and then open it up for questions. And one of the cool things part of this website is what's called the data sheets, the clinical round data sheets. These are one page downloadable documents that take snapshots of different lab tests, whether it's adrenal profile, blood test, uh, metal testing, organic acid testing, and talk about certain markers and what those mean clinically. So we have a whole you know, developing library of these. Um, these actually come out once a week. Okay, so all of this is available as a member through functionalmedicineclinicalrounds.com. If you are a parent or a caregiver of a loved one with autism and you want to interact with me more directly, there's a website called autismrecoverysystem.com. You can actually post questions in the forum. There's an entire biomedical course in this website, um, videos, articles, a lot of other educational material. And we also have a Facebook page at Autism Recovery System on Facebook. If you are needing some assistance in lab testing, Lab Test Plus is a website that provides access to um, much of the Great Plains Laboratory testing, as well as some of the labs as well. And with each lab test comes a written interpretation of the relevant findings and what are called action step suggestions. There's also the ability through this website, if you've already done some lab tests and you want it analyzed, it can be sent to us for that purpose. So you go to labtestplus.com if you have any questions at all about how this website works and the service works, you can email questions to labtestplus at gmail.com. And I'm always available for private consultations as well through my practice. Our website, excuse me, our phone number is 951-461-4800. That's the best email, let me go back, sorry. That's the best email, scmedicalcenter at gmail.com. Our website is mysunrisecenter.com. Okay, everybody, thank you so much. I know if you've posted any questions, they'll be sent to me usually within a few days. Um, it takes a few days to get things answered. Uh, we'll do our best to answer any questions that have come through. Thanks so much for joining me for this webinar. I hope it was informative for you. I'm Dr. Kurt Wohler. Thanks so much.